Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Um, I, uh, if you don't know, I work on Rails and sometimes work on Ruby and sometimes work on Ruby gems and sometimes work on Draper and sometimes work on active model serializers and a bunch of stuff. Um, sometimes I go to conferences. Uh, sometimes I teach Ruby and Rails training classes with Jumpstart Lab. So if anybody wants to get more awesome at Ruby and or Rails, uh, that's what we do. Um, I'm hoping this year is going to be a lot of Ember for me, actually. So I might be slowly transitioning to doing JavaScript stuff, too. Um, this is a talk that I pitched called um, Object-Oriented Programming and Philosophy. Um, because it's sort of a semi-academic topic, I thought it would be really fun to come up here and wear this suit and make some slides that are, have terrible handwriting, just like my professors in college had. So I recently gave this talk, and I got them to actually get me a projector. So I wrote them live while I was giving the talk um, at Heroku's Waza conference. And since there's a lot of money to get that together and it was really hard, um, I decided to just take photographs of my slides and then put them up there. So you don't get the live drawing, but you do get the hand-drawn slides by me that are totally unreadable because I type all the time. I don't write things. Um, so. Uh, that's sort of the background, I guess, about all of this. So we're going to have some good times. I actually don't even have like notes on my slides. I have handwritten notes in this Moleskine. So I was going for like maximum performance um, in this talk. So it's kind of funny. Um, let's kick this off here. So um, the first thing I want to say about, about this talk is that um, one of the great things about philosophy is it's, it's a means of analyzing questions and um, thinking through problems. So while I may have a little bit of, I don't want to say necessarily recommendations in this talk, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm trying to provide you with uh, an example of how using the tools of philosophy when you're programming can help you think about the way that you code. Um, I'm going to trash on object-oriented programming a little bit, but I don't actually think that it's terrible and it's something that I do all the time. But I think that um, some of the lessons that we take from philosophy may indicate that object-oriented programming might not be the best way to write software. Maybe. That's for you to analyze and come to your own conclusions. So, um, but I think ultimately that's the most important part is I'm not trying to preach, but naturally I get preachy. So I apologize in advance. That's not what I'm trying to do. And feel free to, to do something other than what I say, and it'll be awesome. Um, OK, so first of all, a story. Um, I started programming when I was about seven years old. Uh, my uncle was a programmer. He actually built computers and then um, programmed the operating system by flipping physical switches and then pressing a button to store those bits into memory. It was kind of intense. And so he had to explain to his parents what he did. So uh, you know, grandparents already have a hard time understanding technology. Mine are particularly awesome because their son was a programmer. But you know, in the late 80s, um, it was much harder to explain what computers were. Right? They're everywhere now, but they weren't so much then. So um, he brought uh, an Apple, a Mac Plus home to his parents, my grandparents, um, so that he could show them, like, this is what I do all day. And um, I happened to be at my grandma's house that particular day. And um, when he pro opened up the computer, uh, I said, what's this? And he said, it's a computer. Check this out. Here's a little game. And he typed in adventure and hit enter. I don't know if you've ever played the Colossal Cave Adventure. But basically, um, it's a text-based adventure game where it says, uh, you know, you are in this cave. There are passages to the east and west. What do you want to do? And you type, go west. And then it says, cool, now you're in this room with a pirate. What do you want to do? And you're like, stab the pirate. Right? And then the pirate kills you. Game over. Start over again. Um, so I was enthralled the, mo the moment I started doing this programming, or I started playing with this game. And so because he's a programmer, he said, you know, you can make games like this too. Someone had to actually make this. And I was like, wow, this is the neatest thing I'd ever seen. And since I was seven, that was probably actually true. Um, but uh, so my family all chipped in, and they got me a computer that hooked up to the television. It didn't have a monitor at all, right? But it had a basic interpreter. So he basically, even though people assume this story goes with, and then my uncle mentored me through programming. And no, he totally just was like RTFM and handed me the manual and said, here you go, right? He didn't actually say RTFM, but essentially, like, I did not get any help from him. Um, so I was sitting there with, ba with a ba manual explaining all the basic commands and a computer that did not have my adventure game on it. And so I was a very motivated seven-year-old. Um, so I basically spent all the time um, figuring out how to do this programming. And so I wanted to make those kinds of adventure games like I made. So when I was doing this, um, I started out by, of course, designing the game I wanted to make, right? So I drew little maps that looked like this. Um, so you have rooms, and you, know, you can walk through the doorways, like the double lines or the doors. You know? So you draw a grid, and you number them, and you draw all the features that are in them. So you put like, a locked door somewhere, and then a key that matches up. And, um, <coughs> 
I would actually have to write the code that made this work. And once I'd reverse engineered how to make one room, I figured I would copy it and paste the block into another room. Um, and so I'd put these numbers on them. And then what I realized was that it made sense to map the um, numbers to the actual lines of code. Because if you remember in basic, you actually had to number all the lines, right? So, um, so I start off with, OK, room one is actually lines 100 to 200. And then lines two, room two is lines 200 to 300. And it sort of went like that. So there's this direct structure between the way that I would program this game and the way that my code turned out. My understanding of the universe that I'd created had directly affected the design of my software. And like most programming that uh, relies on go-tos and line numbers, it was very hard to follow sometimes, right? And if I decided to change the map, you know, uh, there was, I had to make the decision. Did I want to move that, that line of code to be the new room number? Or did I want to like edit my hand-drawn map to renumber the room and like, you know, change space to move it around? And so, you know, you know, I learned some things about maintainability um, theoretically when I was a little kid. Um, but this is, I guess, the point that I want to make is that um, our understanding of the world shapes the way that we write code. And our understanding of the way that we think the world is shapes the way that we write code. Um, and it shapes the design of our software as well. So um, I want to talk a little bit about a one particular sub-branch of philosophy um, called metaphysics that specifically the question of metaphysics is what kind of stuff in the world is there and what is the kind of stuff that we have like. And so um, I think that those questions are very relevant to programmers because they are how we design, um, do we, how we design code. And so I first got interested in this topic because I thought about um, the fact that there has been all of these developments in one particular branch of, of metaphysics called ontologies, which if you've ever been involved in semantic web or linguistic stuff, you might have heard of ontologies before. But basically an ontology is a list of all the things. So it's sort of the, the end result, uh, if you will, of that process of what kind of stuff is there? Well, there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this. So all those things make up an ontology. Um, so. Um, so I, I was thinking about that and how that we write classes in our, in our programs and we come up with the list of, okay, here's the thing and here's the thing and here's the thing that gets made um, and we're constantly having discussions about the right way to do this process and then I realized there were thousands of years of people trying to answer these same kind of questions in a totally different domain and I felt really dumb that we'd have been ignoring all the developments in ontology from philosophy when we're trying to build ontologies and software. Um, it seemed kind of silly. So I started looking into things, and so I want to share with you a couple of things that I found um, in that sort of uh, um, field. So, cool. I'm managing to talk slower this time. I have a chronic problem of speaking way too fast, and so I'm, I'm attempting to go a little slower, so it's working out. Um, okay. So uh, some more about metaphysics. There's a really great definition. Um, traditionally, philosophy is defined as like the love of wisdom, which is one of those def definitions that sounds great and it's kind of self-congratulatory, but doesn't really mean anything at the same time, right? Like who, who doesn't love wisdom, right? Like he's like, I want to be stupid. Well, maybe Americans or people from the States, but everyone else in the world does not enjoy being stupid. Um, so uh, there's an alternate version of the definition of philosophy that was, that was said by this um, these two guys, um, Deleuze and Guattari, in this book called What is Philosophy, where they defined what philosophy is. Go figure. Um, and they said philosophy is the art of forming, inventing, and fabricating concepts. And so that has a direct connection to programming as far as I'm concerned. That's what we do all day. We invent concepts and then we use them. Sometimes we're good at inventing concepts and our code goes really well. Sometimes we're bad at inventing concepts and our code is really terrible. Um, so ultimately, like, in the same way that we are building and doing things um, that's mostly mental but also a little bit physical, philosophers are kind of doing the same things. They're inventing concepts that we can use as perspectives to look out on the world. And we as programmers are building tools that affect and shape our world. Um, so I think there's this really big um, connection there. Um, although the objects philosophers create are entirely conceptual, and the ones that we create are like mostly conceptual, right? Like bits running in a computer is technically physical, but we don't think about them that way, right? We even say virtual reality or that you know the virtual world. Um, so uh, that's sort of that's the connection. That's the background. So let's talk about exactly what um, what all that stuff is. So um, first up, I want to talk about Plato. Everybody loves the ancient Greeks uh, in philosophy. I think they're overrated, but whatever. Um, but they sort of kicked most of the field off. So um, Plato lived around 350 BC, um, so you know, relatively that old. And um, Alfred Whitehead said, uh, the safest general, general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. So he's sort of important um, in this field and important to understand. But one of the things that's unfortunate is when you base everything off of one thinker, the things that they're wrong about get amplified, right? So um, 
So I think that Plato had some good concepts, and we're going to talk about those good concepts right now. Um, the first one is what's called a form. So Plato believed that there were these forms that existed um, in, in somewhere out there that we could not see, and that they were the abstract concepts behind things. My slides are out of order, apparently, so I'm going to shift through. Oh, did I mess that one up? Darn it. OK, so I'll just do, I'll just do this. This slide works. Um, this is from Git later. Um, but so uh, <laughs> what, what's that thing on the left, right, on the top left-hand side? That's a circle, right? But like, it's not actually a circle, because all the points are not equidistant from the center. But we know and recognize it as a circle, even though it's not actually a circle. And no one has ever drawn a perfect circle, except for maybe what, like Leonardo da Vinci one time or something is a legend about that. But like, basically, a perfect circle has never existed. Yet we talk about circles, and we understand circles. And you can map this imperfect circle to the idea of a perfect circle. So that perfect circle is Plato's notion of a form. So there's a, there's a circleness that exists somewhere, and it affects all things that look like circles. Circles, and that's how we recognize them as circles. The actual drawing up there of that circle would be called an object. It's the physical, real-world circle that may not be perfect, but has that quintessential circleness, and that, that's what we call an attribute. So, so that object has an attribute that gives it its that references its form. So um, that particular circle has circleness that is like the perfect circle, and that's why we see it as a circle. Um, does that make sense? So, uh, so in the same way, this is what we do when we write active record objects, right? So if I'm making, uh, for example, a class chair, uh, that's what that says, class chair inherits from active record base. Yeah, handwriting. Um, and then adder accessor seat, and, and then c equals chair.new, a class definition is kind of like this notion of forms. We have what is a general abstract notion of a chair, and we define what that is. And then we create objects, which are, we also call objects, which are particular instances of a chair. Um, and then we have attributes, which are like adder accessor seat, for example. So every chair, in our ontology, every chair must have a seat. Um, so that's the connection that I see between Plato's theory of forms and object-oriented programming, basically, is that it's the same kind of notion. right? Um, and this is what we say when like, object-oriented programming allows us to model the real world. right? Like, how many examples have you seen with like, uh, you know, a car has an engine, which you know, is a class engine, and it has gears, and like, all these kinds of things. right? Um, the problem is, as you know, it's really hard to write active record classes that actually map to the actual things you need, right? So we heard earlier today talking about callbacks and other things make it really difficult to, to write clean and maintainable code. And there's been a general backlash against active record for the last year or so in, in Ruby world, at least talking about design patterns. Some people, um, including myself, have sort of been talking bad about this. Um, the one other thing that I want to leave uh, the talk about, um, so I want to say there's a problem with this notion of forms. I don't think that it actually works perfectly well. Even though the circle example is great, I think when you start talking, applying it to more complicated concepts, like outside of geometry, it breaks down. Um, so we're going to talk about an alternate model for modeling things that may affect um, the way that we model stuff in software. But first, I want to mention one other thing that you, you might be thinking, like what's missing from object-oriented programming in this diagram? right? Well, no, maybe not OOP, but like active record. There's no methods on this class. right? Well, I mean, there's like a zillion methods, because active record base gives you a zillion methods. But like we didn't define any methods. So those would be forces. Forces are something that acts on different objects. Um, and so what's interesting um, is there's actually a, there's a connection between object-oriented programming and structured programming or functional programming um, in, through currying. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to detour briefly. Before we talk about an alternate way of, of uh, mapping objects or like thinking about objects and their identities, um, I'm going to talk about currying for a second. So um, if you have a function f of x and y, and it gives you x plus y, we can partially apply or curry. There's a dis difference between the two. I don't want to get into it right now, but I'm just asterisking that before someone goes on Twitter. There's a difference between currying. And, um, there's technically a difference. In this case, it's the same thing. Um, between, uh, so you partially apply f. Um, and now, maybe say, with a 3, right? So you say, I'm going to make y be 3. And then we get a new function called f plus 3 that takes one parameter. Um, and that gives us 3 plus y, right? So that's like the idea of a partially applied function. So object-oriented programming is kind of like partial application um, in the sense that when we do something like c.sit Steve, which is like if I'm going to sit on the chair, which is possibly a terrible design, but whatever. Um, I should sit on the chair. The chair shouldn't have me sit on it, probably. I don't know. It's hard. Um, 
But the point is that c.sit chair is kind of like the reverse process. So it's the same thing as sit c chair. And if you've ever programmed in C, you've, you might have like modern C programming tends to take this kind of approach where you have structs and you pass the structs as the first parameter um, to your classes. So you can sort of emulate the idea of object-oriented programming in non-object languages, but it's about the modeling, right? Like this is what we actually care about. And this also maps to functional programming, I guess, as well. So people talk about this debate between like functional versus object-oriented versus structural. Really, they're different perspectives on different kinds of problems. They're not really like technically difficult, right? It ultimately all compiles down to machine code eventually. But the important part is that these three different models of programming, functional, object-oriented, and structured, um, give us different perspectives on how to solve problems. So like, I want to code with objects because objects are nice, right? <laughs> like they're fun to use, they work well, they, they map what I, the way that I think about the world. Um, so, so I don't want to do structured programming, even if they're like mathematically equivalent, right? Um, so, uh, so with that idea as like perspectives is important. So here's an alternate uh, perspective um, about uh, object-oriented programming and why it may not actually map well. Maybe another way that we could think about software and some software tools that we use that already use this different version of, of definitions. So um, the first thing I guess I want to say is that in a way, object-oriented programming is awesome, right? I've sort of just said that thousands of years of philosophical tradition back up what we do every day with OOP, right? So like that's kind of awesome in a certain sense. But there's an issue um, that happens with um, objects under this kind of model, and that's one of identity. So for example, right now I'm up here um, giving a presentation that's mostly about um, philosophy and a little bit about programming. So am I like not a programmer anymore? If, I, if I'm a Rubyist and I write some JavaScript, does that mean I'm no longer a Rubyist? Like what attributes to, exist to Rubyists, right? Like someone who develops in Ruby. Okay, well what does develop mean? If I don't program in Ruby for five years, does that mean I'm no longer a Rubyist? If I don't program in Ruby for one year, am I no longer a Rubyist, right? There's some sort of temporal component. And there's also this question of like, I write Rust sometimes. I'm never gonna get paid to write Rust, at least not for a couple years anyway. So am I, am I a Rustic, which they call Rust programmers, which is awesome. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, I I am technically American, but I don't or from the states. <laughs> we and Sheems have been talking about this all day now, and so now I'm saying it the other way around. Um, I'm technically from the states, but I don't identify with my country at all. So it, it, does that mean I'm still American, right? Like I was born somewhere, but um, you know, does that does that mean that I am the same thing as that person? So basing identity off of these attributes is really really flawed. Um, you know, we could talk about gender, for example, like we. Uh, are people that are born with ambiguous uh, a situation, are they a man or a woman, right? Like that's a question based on attributes is the way that we societally define these things, but that doesn't mean it's actually true. And it gets to be a very complicated question in the real world, right? Like uh, intersex babies are something like, I guess a tenth of a percent or one percent, uh, tenth, a tenth or a hundredth of a percent. So that's like a lot of people that are born that way. Um, so it's a complicated question. The real world is very messy. And so when we try to stuff it into this idea of there's, um, there's objects and they have these attributes and every object has all of these attributes, it falls apart relatively quickly, right? So, um, so I think that a, and there's a more interesting model um, for identity that specifically solves this kind of problem. So to, so to talk about it, um, we're gonna talk about two different concepts. Um, so it's identity as repeated difference. So Difference and repetition are the two big um, concepts here. This comes from that guy I quoted earlier, Deleuze's dissertation, actually. Um, but essentially, uh, repetition is kind of like that saying, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it, right? So uh, why do we keep making the same mistakes all over again, right? Like, why does my country invade Vietnam, wear out all its resources, and then invade Iraq, right? Like, it's like the same thing. Um, why, why do I, uh, you know, make the same mistakes in my code over and over and over again, right? Like it seems like we don't learn from history. Um, so there's a difference though between repetition and copying something. So the, the, the philosophical notion of repetition is more about embodying um, something in particular. So like for example right now I'm channeling my college professors, right? So like I'm repeating them in a certain sense. Um, if I was just incorporating some elements it might be like copying or cargo culting. Um, I guess I'm, that's what I'm saying is that like copying is more like cargo culting and repetition is more like embodying whatever that is. So for example, I would say that um, a Rubyist is someone who repeats mats, right? So if you, if you are nice and you program in Ruby and you build Ruby stuff, then you're a Rubyist. Um, if you don't, 
re you know, repeat the process of being a Rubyist by continuing to code in Ruby all the time, then you're not one anymore, which is fine. It's not a value judgment, but like, you know, if I occasionally dabble in JavaScript, like I know how to program in JavaScript, I don't do it very often. So I don't call myself a JavaScript programmer, even though technically I could get by, right? I have my copy of JavaScript, the good parts, and I could like suffer through it. Um, but I don't repeat, like I don't repeat being a JavaScript person over and over again, so it doesn't count. But there's also this notion you can't perfectly repeat things, right? So there's a difference involved. So I'm repeating my college professors, but I'm also not them. This is not a college class. I mean, it's a college classroom, but you guys aren't paying, or, well, wait, this is Europe. You don't pay ridiculous amounts of money. If you were in the States, you'd be paying a ridiculous amount of money to be here, but you're not. Um, so, uh, you know, but there's, there's, a diff, there's a diff involved. And, um, you know, when I gave this presentation before, it was with a projector, but now I'm giving it with the slides. So that's like a difference as I'm repeating this presentation. Okay, so now comes to Git. This is the software model that Git has. If you thought all that was abstract and bullshit, um, this is what Git does, right? So we have our software, which is the like, for thing on the left, and then we repeat that software over again. It's another copy, but there's a difference this time, and that's the diff that goes from commit one to commit two, right? Or whatever the SHAs end up being. And then when you have these branches and all these things and, and merging, um, that's the idea of we're repeating our project over and over and over again, right? Like, simple version control would actually literally be making copies, right? Uh, but we decided to store the diffs because that's more um, efficient. But um, this is sort of based this way. So this is called a process-based ontology, and that's because it includes this time component as opposed to being based on attributes. So the software is not about, um, it doesn't have some sort of essential, essential attribute of your project-ness. Like if I'm writing a blog, it's not, that it, it's not a blog because it's, it's uh, essentially a blog. It's a blog because it's repeating the same kind of tropes, if you will, that we've seen in blogs time and time again. And it continues to be my project because it's, the, it's my code over and over and over again. Um, I'm also really interested in Datomic is another, another um, piece of software based on this notion of difference and repetition. So in Datomic, I don't know if you guys have ever used it, it's from the Clojure world. Is, how many people are familiar with Datomic? Awesome. You guys are cool. I want to use it yet. Is it as awesome as it seems like it is? Good? Good now? Oh, well. Um, conceptually, I really like it. Um, so what Datomic does, um, Datomic is sort of like a triple store with an extra time parameter on it. So if you imagine a database, there's no tables, there's no rows, there's no columns. You just store facts, um, and those facts have a timestamp. And so when you insert a new version of the fact, you append something in. There's no way to call update on a table in Datomic. There's no destruction of the data in the database. You just append new information. Facts change, which is a funny thing about facts, right? Um, they call them datums. Um, but uh, you append stuff um, later, and so you're repeating those facts over with a difference. Um, this is really cool because it lets you do really awesome queries, or so I've heard, like, um, what was the database like last Thursday? Right? Like, how many users did I have then? And because you're not incrementing numbers um, and you're not destroying the historical data that would be stored in your database, you're able to do all these really cool things because we embody the fact that our software has, or our data has a temporal component. Um, so I want to use Datomic, even if it's not good in production, because I think it's neat. Um, so uh, this also relates to a little bit about what we talk about with design, but also we talked about with security earlier today, is that um, the most important thing to remember about OOP design is that it's a process, right? So um, I've almost never gotten code to a point where I'm 100% perfectly happy with it, right? At some point, you have to stop bike shedding and stop like worrying about all of the details and just say, you know what? It's good enough. I'm going to work on something else. It's so, like two weeks ago, I went and cleaned up the code that's in my blog. And um, I did a lot of cleaning up, but I'm still not really happy with it, but it's a lot better than it was. So, you know, but design is, is this process over time. And that's one of the things I think is unfortunate about design discussions um, in blogs when we talk about it on the web, is that we eliminate this, this temporal component or this context component, right? So if you have a team full of new people um, using a totally brand new hot design technology like say DCI might not be the best way to go because they haven't even wrapped their heads around the basics of programming, let alone using advanced design patterns, right? Even if in, in a vacuum that would be a better way to design software, it's possible that on your team it's not the right way to design software. So I've advised people, for example, to not build hypermedia APIs before because they were the only person that cared about them whatsoever on their team. And I was like, do you want to be the person that's responsible for the entire design of all of your stuff. Do you think it's a good idea to bet your entire product on you specifically? What happens if you don't want this job anymore? What are you going to train all of your coworkers, right? So, um, so we have to remember there's always context involved in design. 
Um, and security, I would say, is also a process, right? So this is where we talk about what can we learn, what can you do better in the future? Because there are always going to be security bugs. We can't possibly eliminate all security issues um, ever. Um, so it's about process. Um, Often people, before I worked on Rails, I had a much different idea of what Rails development was right, like, right? So I, I used to think that we had like a very strict plan and a release plan and we followed them. We came up with, you know, uh, like, like most products do, you like invent, here's all the things I want. Let's put these ones in a release. Let's build those. Let's release it. It's actually more just like everybody works on what they want to work on. And then after there's a bunch of changes, we say, oh, we probably should release a new version. And then we release a new version. Um, it works relatively well. You all are using Rails. Um, but uh, a lot of people give me this question about like, where can I get the prioritized backlog of issues and features that I need to, that Rails puts in? And I kind of just like giggle um, because we don't have one. Um, and so most of your questions to why Rails sucks or why Rails is hard or why Rails is confusing is literally just nobody has written the patch for that yet. Um, that's really awesome because that means that you can jump in and write a patch um, or help out or whatever. But most of the questions when people, most of the time, sometimes not, right? So um, sometimes it's a deliberate decision, but most of the time, um, at least historical things. So for example, why can you put YAML in your XML, uh, you know, is like, well, some people wrote some features and they came together in a weird way and we didn't know that the, the Ruby world was very different when that code was written and nobody's touched it in a long time. So that's why. It's not like we're advocating something that's necessarily a terrible practice. It just happened because of context. Um, and refactoring is also this way too with object-oriented design, right? You have to keep the context of what you're trying to achieve um, in, it, it, while you're doing it. You can't like lose sight of the goal, right? You don't want to spend all day refactoring a tiny little bit of your code base. Um, you need to make good use of your time. Um, so uh, yeah, this also comes in a lot of other places in software. So like for example, Agile theoretically is supposed to be about a process and principles over like you know, exact details. Right? You're, supposed to, you're supposed to adapt Agile to your team. No one does that, of course. They hire consultants for a lot of money to come in and like, tell them what Agile is. I, I've been to companies that are like, we're on our sixth year of our transition to Agile. Um, and it's like, <laughs> oh, God. Um, and in some senses, they're doing it right. They're slowly moving towards a process that they want. But you know, that doesn't mean it can't be painful. But it's important to keep in mind that it is a process and you're not doing it perfectly. Um, also, it's important to remember that change is very painful. Um, too, right? So like the thing that sucks about process is it means that you're slowly, slowly making code better, right? So I teach a lot of beginners. Um, I recently gave a speech to some beginners at New York, uh, in New York City, and they asked me like, what's, what is everyday programming like? And I like walked up to a wall and I just like smacked my head off of it a bunch of times. <laughs> um, and, and they're like, you're not doing a very good job of this. And I was like, no, but it's amazing because when you solve the problem, it feels really good, right? So programming in itself is a process. If our code, if our software worked and it had all the features we wanted, we'd be done, right? Like you are only programming if things are broken or incomplete. So we're in this perpetual state of like pain and annoyance. And I think that's why we're all really surly online a lot of times to each other. It's because like we literally would not be doing what we're doing if computers did what we wanted already. We'd just be using them, right? Um, so that's important to remember too. Um, is that like change is painful and processes are all about change because you have this point A to point B in your process. So if you're still at point A, something is painful about it. Um, so, uh, okay. So that is essentially most of what I have. I want to make, say a couple, a couple things. So I have eight minutes left over. Um, the first one is, is that if this topic interests you at all, the idea of like reading philosophy or doing philosophy and applying it to software, um, we actually started, me and my friend Greg started a mailing list, uh, a Google group, philosophy in a time of software. Um, so if you check that out, we're taking anybody at all who has a vague, the vaguest interest and even no experience in this topic. So there's lots of people who are like, I would like to, I've always wanted to read philosophy, but I've never found a way of doing it. Uh, so let's talk about how to do that. Or, you know, I just read this, uh, this piece of sociology that could be kind of philosophy in some ways. And I want to talk about how it um, relates to programming, right? So we had a recent thread about there's a sociologist named Bruno Latour that argues that all sociologists suck because they make a too much abstraction and they don't actually talk about what people actually do. They come up with big metaphors like uh, people from the states or capitalism or war um, instead of talking about the exact relationships between people. And he rails against this abstraction process. 
Well, you know, I see that as being very similar to the people who complain about that Rails is over abstracted and too magic, right? Like we need to get down to the metal. We need to do these kinds of stuff. So we talk about these kinds of mappings between, you know, like books that we read and, pro and program that we do. So if that interests you at all, there's a mailing list um, and it's up there. Um, okay. Seven more minutes. I have, a, I have a quick bonus round, briefly. Um, it's about Nietzsche and Nokogiri, um, actually. I have a blog post in the works called Nietzsche Loves Nokogiri, so here's a, like a preview of what I will eventually write. Um, so uh, Nietzsche has a couple, a couple concepts that are really important um, that I think are good for programmers and how we should like be um, and live. So. Um, the first one is this concept of what's called master and slave morality. So the idea is that uh, if, you, if you have the slave morality, you say, I am good because that other person is bad. The guy in charge, my boss sucks, therefore I'm awesome, is an example of what he would call slave morality. The master morality is, I'm awesome, so you're terrible. So the boss is like, you're not a boss yet, so you suck. Um, and that's the idea of master morality. Nietzsche says that both of these are terrible. And that uh, if we truly want to advance as humans, we need to get over defining ourselves in terms of other people, and we need to forge our own path forward and build stuff instead of worrying about what other people think about us. Um, and he called this concept the will to power and the person who would eventually achieve this to be the overman. So um, I always try to keep that um, in mind, uh, although it's really, really hard, right? Like every single one of you who follows me on Twitter is like, Steve is such full of shit right now because he complains about things all the time. But I'm trying to not do that as much um, going forward. Because the important part is that, uh, that like, you should be trying to create and build things and affirming life rather than worrying about who sucks and who doesn't suck. You should be building and doing things. And that was like the main message of Nietzsche as far as I'm concerned. Um, most, people think, most people who don't know anything about philosophy think that Nietzsche was a nihilist, but he actually just described nihilism and talked about how to destroy it, um, which is kind of funny too. But anyway, so this, this matters with Nokogiri, actually. Um, one of the recent things that we did with shoes was remove hpricot and put in Nokogiri. And some of you are like, you're still using hpricot? And the answer is like, yes, because of some crap that happened. But if uh, those of you who might have been around, who was who, who around for the hpricot versus Nokogiri controversy? Are you guys newer to Ruby and Rails than that? Do you know what I'm talking about? OK. So TLDR, why the lucky stiff made this XML parsing library named hpricot. It was fine, but it was kind of slow and a little awkward. So Aaron Patterson ended up making a gem called Nokogiri. They did the same thing, but better. Um, Peter Cooper and Ruby Inside posted some benchmarks that showed that Nokogiri was like seven times faster than hpricot. So Y wrote some patches and the next day came out with the hpricot is a little bit faster than Nokogiri. And there was this big controversy about them. And then then Y disappeared and Aaron's still here. So we all use Nokogiri now. Or, or, uh, yeah, Nokogiri now. But we theoretically would have used hpricot back in the day. It was a really big controversy. And Shoes had hpricot in it. And Shoes is Y's project. And I took it over. And so some people saw the act of me replacing hpricot with Nokogiri to be a little bit blasphemous. Um, but the important thing to remember about hpricot and Nokogiri is I was actually digging into this history recently. And there was an email that Y the Lucky Stiff posted on the Ruby Talk mailing list where he said, um, he said the Aaron, I love Nokogiri. The only, the only reason I'm continuing to work on hpricot is to make you better. Not make Nokogiri better, but to make Aaron better. So, so he wanted this like friendly rivalry as a way of like they both were building things as opposed to like even though there was a little bit of back and forth about like you know one being better than the other um, rather than Aaron writing a blog post that said Nokogiri or hpricot sucks he like built a gem and said. I think the existing solutions are inadequate, so here's my alternative, right? Like, I built this thing, please use it. Um, and so I think that that's way, way better than um, essentially just saying that something sucks, is providing an alternative or building something to replace it, right? Because if it sucks and you have nothing to replace it with, what are you going to do, right? Like, you can't, you still need to parse XML, so it doesn't help you that it sucks. It helps you to have a replacement that's better. Um, but. So, so that thing about the will to power and the overman and, and master slave morality reminds me of one of Wise's favorite tweets. Uh, well, two of them, actually. Two of Wise's tweets that I, that I remember. The first one said, um, Caller asks, should I use hpricot or nokogiri? Answer, nokogiri, unless you're me, in which case you use, uh, and uh, if you're not me, uh, you should use H, H, if you're not me, you should use nokogiri. If you are me, you should stop being me. Um, <laughs> And I thought that was really funny, especially since the last couple years I've been trying to just keep wise projects alive, 
right? So like in some senses, I am trying to, not trying to be why, but like keeping this thing alive in his spirit. And so I thought it was really important that we take his projects that we're continuing to use and make them our own, right? And stop being why the lucky stiff. So I think it's important to, to use Nokogiri now in shoes because of that, right? Like he's gone and we're us. And so we should be doing what's best for us now instead of like trying to remember like not, we don't want what would why do, right? Like that's silly. We should be talking about what we want to do. Um, and the other one um, was something along the lines of, um, your tastes only serve to exclude other people. Uh, so instead, create, right? I'm botching it slightly, but that was the thrust of it. And so I think that that's the same lesson that, uh, that Nietzsche had for us as well, and why the lucky stiff. So as far as I'm concerned, that's what we should do, because they're both awesome, right? Um, OK, so yes. Uh, thank you. This has been OOP and, and the history of philosophy. You can yell at me on Twitter uh, about how I'm wrong and or build alternatives to Twitter and then yell at me on those. Um, I did that once already. Uh, and uh, yes, go forth, build awesome stuff, and uh, be creative. Thanks. Yeah. You can always email me with questions later, too, if you think of something. Just in general, you can always email me about anything, period. Uh, you haven't mentioned at all mathematics and the correspondence between the object oriented programming and, and mathematics. And I believe that uh, there's a missing point between the object oriented programming plus uh, mathematics and the philosophy. So the philosophy uh, is, expo is exposed uh, in the mathematical way. Sometimes, I guess, uh, there's this really big division between like continental and analytic philosophy, right? So a lot of philosophy in the analytic tradition is, is like math proofs, but a lot of philosophy in the continental tradition, which is what I'm much more familiar with, is much more um, about writing and stories, and, and it's still rigorous, but in a different way. So there definitely is a connection sometimes. Um, I guess I'm not sure 100%. I mean, obviously, there's math and computers, right? I have another really interesting thing about like the lambda calculus uh, and how it applies to stuff. I don't want to get into that right now, but um, there definitely is some connection between between all of these things, right? Like, uh, if if the very not at the very least, there's a connection because we all want to talk about all of them and they all exist in some form, right? So I think that you're right that there's some sort of missing exact connection between the two. Um, I have some ideas specifically about lambda calculus, but I'm not really ready to talk about them yet. So, but I think I think I agree with you. There's something missing. Let's put it that way. Any other questions? Sweet. Thanks. Thank you.